Hello, hello, and welcome to Backstage Storytelling in Theatrical Productions. My name is Kaylin Sakima. My pronouns are he, him, and I'll be moderating today's session. The visuals in today's video only support what is spoken. The visuals do not provide additional information. Today, I am very grateful for the opportunity to get to know these four individuals within the theatrical production industry. So please help me welcome, we're gonna, we're trying to get this in order here, <laughs> production designer and film director, David Murakami. We have Andy Lowe, which is the casting director for East West Players. We also have award nominated scenic designer, Randy Wong Westbrook, and stage manager, producer, Jonathan Castillian. So welcome to the first annual man for us, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us. So let's just jump straight right into it. Let's go right into this. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourselves? And we'll go in the order um, that we see on screen. So we'll go David, Andy, Randy, Jonathan. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Murakami. I am uh, speaking to you from the land of the Tongva people here in Los Angeles, California. Um, briefly about myself, I'm a projection designer working in live performance. Uh, majority of my work is opera, but I also work in theater, musical theater, dance, themed entertainment, that sort of thing. Uh, I teach projection design at UC Irvine Theater Arts, uh, the grad program there. Uh, and um, I have a nine month old daughter at home who's a quarter Japanese, quarter Chinese, quarter Jewish, and quarter Anglo. So I am very happy to be here with you all. Uh, hi, my name is Andy Lowe. I'm uh, the director of production and casting for East West Players. Uh, I originally come from the land of the Kumigai in San Diego, but I currently live in Los Angeles uh, in the land of the Tongva. Um, I am a director by trade, um, but have, uh, in support of that directing career, uh, self been a producer, um, you know, uh, scenic and lighting designer, uh, stagehand, um, uh, Casting, I uh, do do casting for East West players as uh, we mentioned earlier. Before uh, I work in realms of theater, uh, themed entertainment, and anything else that will let me. <laughs> Hi, team. I'm Randy Wong Westbrook. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am primarily a, a scenic designer, and um, I am a mixed race, uh, non-binary, transmasculine person. Um, with a sort of dark colored mullet happening with some uh, shaved heads and I have pink acrylic glasses and I'm wearing a gray v-neck t-shirt um, in front of a white background. I am uh, born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area on the unse unceded land of the Ohlone people, but in just the past week and a half I have moved down to Los Angeles um, on the land of the Chumash people and um, will be starting uh, my master's program at UCLA um, this next week, um, <laughs> focusing in scenic design and the production design path. Hi, I'm Jonathan Castanian, and I am a stage manager and a producer and co-founder of The Song Collective. I'm calling in from um, Brooklyn, New York, which is the unceded land of the Lenape people. Um, I'm a mixed race Vietnamese man, a cisgendered man with dark brown hair parted on the right hand side, wearing a dark gray shirt, a gray door behind me, and then a bed that's gray and green. Awesome. So thank you all for your introductions. Um, I want to get into something, I guess, I mean, not personal, but let's start off with the good core chunk. When did you know you wanted to pursue this specific career within the theater industry? Was there like a moment that made you say, oh, I want to do that, or you saw something? Like, what, what was what, what was that? Well, we'll start with David again. Uh, the short answer is I didn't know I wanted to do it until I was in it. Uh, I went to school for film, uh, and I wrote and directed, you know, seven feature length films in college. I was like full on, I'm going to be a film director. I was writing screenplays left and right. Uh, and then door opened the theater arts, uh, had a, you know, asked for someone to film a dance show. And when, you know, when you're, when you're a young, anything in the arts, you always say yes, you all, you know, yes, of course I will come and I'll film your dance show. Um, and that led to, hey, can you 
can you direct a theater production? I'm like, well, I only know film. So I brought a bit of film into a bit of theater and then projection design happened. And um, I didn't know I loved it until I did it. And, you know, unlike film, you know, you get screenings, but there's nothing quite like opening night to really make you feel like, wow, I want to do this again. I want to do this every day. So uh, didn't know it until I was in it. Awesome. Andy? Uh, similar, uh, uh, you know, it just kind of happened, honestly, I, I actually got into the business, I'd grown up around the theater, uh, uh, around uh, my sisters, who were all practitioners, actors, uh, and performers. Um, uh, but I was the shy one of the family. And I thought I was gonna sit behind a sketchbook and uh, write graphic novels, quite honestly. Uh, but it wasn't until I would say in my kind of late high school and early college years, when I um, I discovered that uh, I actually I got involved in, in kind of local community activism and I realized that theater and performance was a method of protest and a method of social just uh, of, of action towards social social justice. And that's kind of how I started doing doing theater as a practitioner. Um, and, uh, you know, 20 years later, I'm still doing that. <laughs> Awesome. Randy? Yeah, so um, my, my story in, in the quick version, um, in high school, many of us is where we discover theater and um, at the time of, of me sort of figuring out my queerness, um, did I realize that theater was a place where I could be myself. And so there was that need sort of was filled in high school, but um, I didn't know that theater was like a real thing, like it was a real job, a real career that I could have, that only a select few could actually do it. Um, but I knew what being a teacher was. So I initially went to college um, and with full intention of being like a history teacher. Um, but I was fortunate to have landed at a school, I think a college that had such a strong um, theater program and a very strong technical theater program that um, when I was a backstage crew member, I realized that, oh, this could happen at a much bigger scale. Oh my God, there's other students deciding to do this for their career. Um, and then I knew it was possible. But I think um, I'm remembering of one moment specifically though, um, in my sophomore year, um, where one of my professors um, like introduced me to just some of the work and the person of Che Yu. And um, even as a scenic designer, just having someone show me someone to look up to, someone like, hey, go look at this person's work. Um, mm -hmm. That really changed um, a lot of things because I knew queer wise I could fit in this community, but someone had showed me uh, an Asian masculine per person in the industry who was a leader um, in the industry. And that really locked in a whole new sense of belonging, I think, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And Jonathan? Yeah, um, I got into theater in middle school and did it all through high school, but initially I had only done acting. Um, but I knew at the end of high school that I didn't want to pursue acting. I think even then, at that age, at that time, I was like, what parts are there for me? So I just felt like I, I couldn't pursue it. Um, so my high school theater teacher suggested I do stage management because of like my leadership skills and everything I was doing within the department. Um, so I just, I went to college and picked stage management barely knowing anything about it. And um, it all sort of clicked and made sense to me and I did well on it. So I just kept going forward and I've always kind of kept my mind open to different things in theater that I could do or try out. Um, and that's kind of also how the producing end um, fell into my, I guess my my hyphenates. <laughs> awesome. So everyone's mentioned college to some degree. And um, when I was reading up on everybody, uh, I noticed that everyone achieved their bachelor's degree. Uh, but if I read correctly, David and Randy, you both are getting your master's or either have your master's. So would anybody like to speak to um, about their higher education journey? Like, did it help you? Was it necessary? And you know, why did you choose to go get a master's and what has, how has it benefited you? No that pressure. Is a very, that's a very <laughs> big question. Uh, I, I, I will say this um, with the, pre the preface that uh, I am but one view 
to, to answer your question, and I guess the, the, the important bit of your question is for those who are listening or watching, should you get a master's in theater? Uh, and the answer to that is it depends because, and this is going to sound very, this is going to sound very, oh, what's it? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, blunt. But the most important thing that a master's in theater gets you are connections. And it really depends on where you're going. Uh, I, of course, more education is better. You're exposed to more things you learn about, like, you know, undergrad, you learn about the basics, but then you start learning about Bouteau in, in, and like, and really interesting, like intersections between all the different aspects of education and, and theater. And so masters are wonderful, but at the end of the day, the thing that it gets you are connections. Um, and that's why Yale has such a great master's program, not because necessarily they teach you better in Yale, but because when you go to Yale for theater arts, you know people and, you get references and that's ultimately what it's about. So um, I teach right now, I got my master's at UC Santa Cruz right when it was just starting, which by the way is the only reason why I got it because my grades were not that great. And, but they started the program and they're like, hey, do you wanna join without applying? I'm like, yeah, cause otherwise I'm not gonna get that chance ever again. Um, and I'm glad I did because now I have it uh, to teach. So now I teach at the master's program at UC Irvine um, which has been a wonderful experience. And anyone who's looking for a degree in theater should definitely look at UC Irvine. I'm gonna plug them because they're <laughs> they're wonderful. Um, but yeah, the the um, that that is my blunt assessment is that honestly, it's it, master's programs give you connections. And that's the most important thing when you're deciding to go to a master's program. You know, are those professors people who I want to connect with? Are they people I look up to? Are they people who I really not only want to learn from but potentially work with? Um, those are the sort of questions you should be asking yourself. I can definitely just go after that as I have <laughs> just recently gone through the application process and I'm starting next week. Um, a, a lot of those intentions I think I resonate with. Um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, I'd been there for five years after finishing undergrad, which for me has felt like the perfect amount of time to go out and do a lot of bad theater, do a lot of great theater too, but also meet people and then learn mis and make mistakes and um, learn what feels good, both collaboratively and also as far as my own boundaries and limits and figure out what it is I wanna work on. Um, but I felt like as far as a ladder, I can't quite climb in that particular region um, much further without getting a fancy piece of paper. Um, and so that's one of the many reasons why I, I wanna go back to school. Um, I also was actively seeking out um, not just a single mentor, but a whole a larger faculty that um, wasn't all white. Um, and so um, UCLA I think has checks a lot of those boxes, <laughs> um, just as far as having a, a diversity of professors um, in, in more ways than one. And um, even though I may not like be taking a class with some of these people, the fact that there's many Asian, East Asian, mixed race and trans faculty here at UCLA um, is so exciting to me. Um, that doesn't exactly exist in the same way at a place like Yale. Um, we're all working on it, we're all getting better, but um, to have the, the head of design here, Mang Hee Cho, be the head was super exciting and attractive to me. Um, having had only white male scenic design professors um, throughout undergrad. Um, but also, you know, as David, you mentioned, like grad, grad school can be a place where you explore really unique ideas, um, really specialized sort of areas of design and, and education. Um, while I feel like an undergrad, I was really able to connect personally with my queer identity in my work. I haven't yet felt like I've had the chance to look at my racial identity in my work and the sort of conversations of how do I bring that part of my experience to my work? How do I, how am I involved in rooms that are about Asian stories, even though I have a pretty mixed, maybe a little whitewashed of a background? Those questions are ones I, I'm excited to start diving into in school. And I know it's gonna be really personally heavy to do so, but also I think I'm excited about what can come out of it creatively. So those are some of my reasons for going back um, I'll, I'll chime in on this a little bit, and I'll definitely echo kind of what what both Randy and, and, and David are saying in terms of, you know, uh, do you need grad school? I don't know that you need grad school, right? I, I think there are many people that um, 
go to grad school or e e even, um, you know, just even bachelor's programs, um, expecting to get um, your craft or your training. But that's not necessarily the, the only way, uh, right? Um, um, a lot of all of this art making is like, you know, there there is still it's it's an industry that is still very much um, whatever it seems like on paper is still very much in an apprenticeship model, right? Um, you learn by doing, you learn by who you influences you. Uh, sometimes your mentors are not people you ever get to meet. Sometimes your mentors are people that you see in documentaries and, and, you know, special features on DVDs, right. That teach you things about storytelling. Right. Um, but in terms of an industry, right. That's like the difference between the art making and the industry, right. All of these activities are all about, uh, uh, ensemble, ensemble building or tribe finding, shall we say, right. Uh, whether you start a theater company you know, and build a nonprofit organization and build an ensemble around yourself, you know, that, that you have a, a collaborator base or it's like you find roommates that uh, go to the same improv school with you and you develop a rapport with them, or, you know, you go to a grad school and you come up with the other MFAs and that MFA director is going to bring you in <laughs> on every single project or that MFA playwright who's going to re request you as a director when they get picked up by, you know, a regional producer, right? That's, that's what that is. It's not, you know, uh, uh, we say networking and people go, Oh, networking. It feels gross. feels fake. It's like, and, you know, honestly, it's finding your collaborators. It's finding your tribe. It's finding people you jive with, whether they are 20 or 30 years, your senior and they jive with you and you you learn things just working on projects with them. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that is a certain reality in terms of, you know, what is grad school? It's a place to find a tribe uh, and find mentorship. And business context, because yeah, referrals, <laughs> everything is referrals. Yeah, awesome. The, Donathan, did you want to add to that? I mean, uh, I just, gonna one up what everyone said. I mean, at the end of the day, I think it really is about connections and it's about what works best for you and your needs and where you're at. Um, because there are plenty of people who have no degrees in theater or no degrees at all, and they're working just fine. Um, I went to a state school um, and I am working with people who went to Yale at the same time. So it, it really isn't about necessarily where you go, but, um, it's about how you um, approach the industry, kind of like what Andy's saying and meeting the right people and showing that you are um, a strong collaborator, a reliable collaborator. Actually, yeah, awesome. can I, I add have, one thing? Oh. Yeah, yeah, add one thing it. to that, actually. I actually do not have a degree. <laughs> I went to UCSD for a number of years. Uh, I did not complete my undergrad um, and am like, I believe one stats a, a class away from a degree. But uh, and and I will say, this industry, you know, as a person of color, as an Asian American, um, this industry is brutal, and it can be especially brutal if you do not have these tribes or you do not have mentors uh, vying for you. Right? I I say this right now as someone who's I, I consider myself a director first, and I have not. Well, okay, I've only once ever been hired by someone as a director. All of my you know, 40 some odd directing credits were self-produced, right? Um, I am now, you know, hired as a producer, uh, production manager and casting director for East West Players. So it's like, you know, you can get by, you can make it in this industry, but it is going to be uphill in other ways when you don't have people um, vying for you or supporting or sticking their foot in the door or sending the elevator back down, whatever analogy you want to use. Um, and that's the the real value of these programs, you know, and 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 honestly, I would say programs have more opportunities for people that look like us now than they did when I started college, um, you know, because there was no Asian American theater class at my program. There was no Asian American theater professor at my program at all. 
There was no Asian American studies program in the whole college overall, despite having a 47% enrollment of Asian Americans, right? So that, you know, that culture also kind of influenced my path in terms of, you know what, I'm just going to go found a theater company. I'm going to be an artistic director for 10 years and keep plugging away and find alternate routes uh, and be my own mentor, which, which sucks a lot. I'm just going to say it straight up sucks to be your own mentor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank everyone hit a little bit of um, a different area that smashed like my next two questions, which is awesome. But the reason why I brought that up was because a lot of these opportunities, um, edu higher educational as well as internships and learning on the job are very geographically specific. And so what I was wanting to touch base on next was what advice would you give to somebody who may not have the opportunity to be a part of one of these programs or may not be in a theatrical heavy city. I know you guys touched base on finding your tribe and, you know, trial and error with different, you know, with routes, but is there anything that you guys want to say to that, speaking to that? Dun, dun, dun. No. I mean, I mean, the, the, again, I, I seem like I'm, I'm getting all the downer answers. Uh, the downer <laughs> answer is you got to move. If you're in a if you're in a city that doesn't got theater, you got to move if you want to do. That. Yeah, it's um, it's the kind of thing where there are a lot of arts that can be done remotely, and of course, in the era of pandemic, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but no, I mean, L.A., Chicago, New York, pick one. I mean, it's, or something like that. And there are others, of course. That's a hyper oversimplification. Of course, everyone who's watching, I'm sure, suddenly up in arms. I didn't I didn't list your city. Um, but but you have to tra you have to travel. You have to go on your pilgrimage if, if this is what you want to do, uh, because you have to be submersed in it. I, I can't tell you the number of people who told me I was crazy for not moving to New York when I first started my career. They're like, you got to move to New York. And I'm like, well, I, I have one foot in the film industry. I feel like I should stay in LA. And that worked out very well for me because I all of my collaborators, whenever I do a big projection design job, I'm hiring people who are compositors, who are camera operators, who are drone operators, whatever the needs of the show might be. So I'm very glad that I'm in LA, but the point is that I am somewhere that makes sense for the career that I've carved out and the name that I've made for myself. Um, so yeah, I mean, you have to travel to to find opportunity, which is in some way a privileged answer because travel and being able to just move to where theater is, is a privileged experience, um, but it, it's collaborative, it's in person. You gotta be able to feel the person next to you working together and so yeah, um, that's that's my answer for that. There's um, one thing that I'm thinking of that is not my own experience, but um, I, I see it happen in, in the American industry is there is such a focus on specialization that you are like only a scenic designer. And like there are a handful of like scenic and costume designers or scenic and lighting designers. But um, I think there is an undervaluing of those who are multi-hyphenate. And um, say grad school is a route that you feel like you need or want, like I recommend taking time um, before you go, before you go to a program that is going to want to try to specialize you. Um, take the time to figure out what it is you actually want um, to spend those two or three years focusing on. Um, because I think you need to go to a place or go or move around, you know, as you're figuring things out, like and that timeline is yours. Um, yes everyone's circumstances are a little different and yes it's exciting to try to make it happen go 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 but um my encouragement would be to, to actually take your time trying to figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are what really fuels you and how to do this work sustainably um and then find a program or a community um that is gonna help you in making that a sustainable life choice <laughs> You know, I, I want to react to that specific uh, thing, too, because uh, that is something I definitely feel um, as someone who has worked in, you know, large lort houses um, as well as smaller uh, organizations is that, you know, I mean, kind of working in working in small theater, um, you know, I, I, I did have to be my own lighting designer. I did have to be my own set designer. And as I started doing larger shows, um, you know, I, I feel at least <laughs> if I do say so myself, is that as a director, I'm a really efficient director. 
Um, I, I know how to talk to my set designer. I know how, how to support their creative process. I know how to talk to my lighting designer. I know, I understand color palettes. Um, and I, I, I see so many directors uh, that do not have this vocabulary or do not have kind of a sense of, you know, they'll say, oh, I want sexy lighting. Well, what is sexy lighting? That doesn't mean anything, right? Uh, I've had a director to ask me that as a lighting designer. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, and and uh, it, 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 it's a thing to me where I always, I always say it's like, that's like a painter that doesn't know how to mix their own paint, right? Um, uh, uh, and, and it is an issue, I think, a problem with kind of how we teach um, these disciplines, right? Uh, that there, there are huge gaps um, as we try to specialize in kind of pigeonhole and narrow people's vision where, you know, it's like, it's not just about design. Design is storytelling, right? There are choices that tell a story. Um, and, and as a director, um, understanding how to speak about those choices and find the details and, and hybridize and amalgamate them. Um, is 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 a huge and important thing that I, I think you all you know who are pursuing you know um, um, some of these more structured paths are going to have to find for yourself um, um, to be in a more effective artist. Yeah, um, going down the path of of being multi hyphenate, I think. I was very fortunate in my undergrad to go to a program where they encouraged us to specialize in multiple disciplines at once and explore. Um, and our base education is in every design discipline. So as a stage manager, that's really helped me a lot in terms of like what Andy was saying and communication and just understanding the different vocabulary that everyone works with. Um, and it's also given me the flexibility of like, I used to live in, Orange County, California. I'm born and raised from California. And I left there because um, it wasn't providing me with the opportunity I was seeking as a as an artist, as a theater artist. So I left and went to New York. Um, and because I had that experience and flexibility of understanding different disciplines and how things work, I was able to maybe not stage manage when I got here, but I was like a board op. I was able to assist people. I was able to be on on deck and run the show. So um, it's always, I always encourage people to to be multi-hyphenate. I think specialization is just not useful for people, um, especially in a field that's so collaborative. It just doesn't make sense um, as everyone's pointed out. And I think also and to answer, I think more of your question, I would encourage people in like places where there's not as like, it's not like a big theater town, maybe to also seek out like, maybe there's one tour house near you where these Broadway shows come into town. Try to figure out where that is if there's one near you and try to figure out how to get the contact info of the people coming in with the show. So like a lot of times I would try to find a way to get the email address of a stage manager on like um, the Wicked tour. So I would reach out to them and be like, hey, I would love to shadow you just to see how you call the show, what it's like backstage, I'm learning. Um, or if you want, we can get a coffee and I can just like ask you a few questions to get to know you and your, your, your life history. Um, and most of the time, unless they're super busy, they're really, most people are really willing to meet with people coming up or students um, because we all know how difficult this industry is. Um, so I think, we really try to make that time for others because um, a lot of us have benefited from others who did that for us. I definitely did that and met someone who was on BART on the vocal transit system in the Bay Area and she was a wig person for Wicked. And we exchanged contact information and she took me on a backstage tour with my family of Wicked and I got to stand on the Orpheum stage where it all started. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> Awesome. I'll, I'll jump in again if, if that's all right. I, I just am so yeah, in love with the, the, the term multi-hyphenate. I, I heard that a long time ago, but the way you said it again just totally jogged my mind. I want to build off it, though, and and provide a, a, slightly, a slightly different perspective or, or a little bit more in that I agree. And my 
own path has been entirely multi-hyphenate. And the only reason why I am where I am is because I started in film and I kept an open mind enough to transition over to a completely different career. And those two things together has enabled me to do what I do. That being said, and, and Andy sort of got to this a little bit when he was talking about like working in Lort theaters, the bigger and bigger houses that I've gone to, and you know, now I, I sort of, I work internationally, I work uh, across the country. And once you get to a certain level, there is, for better or for worse, that expectation that you are not only a specialist in that you are a projection designer, you're a scenic designer, you're whatever, but also you have like your own, like as a scenic designer, you might specialize specifically in site-specific art. You might specialize in found materials as a costume designer. You know, like what is it? What is your calling card? What makes you the, oh, someone says, I got a guy or what, you know, whatever. It's, you know, that, that sort of expression they have this person who is the specialist in this particular thing. So my advice early on is, yeah, multi-hyphenate, absolutely. That's how you develop, that's how you learn. But there is an expectation in, in theater, in the more, you know, factory line companies like you would get with Lort and other places that there's an expectation that you are specialized. Yeah, awesome. I'm going, um, I'm going to pivot just slightly. Um, because I feel like this is a great topic to segue. But uh, before I prevent the next question, I want to focus it towards the industry's big pivot to finally create more diversity and inclusion. So for those of you in a hiring position of power, how do you navigate mixed AAPI individuals without limiting creative work only to the ethnicity presented in the story? So in other words, how does a mixed individual authentically be seen without the negative stigma of this person isn't blank enough. Wow, I went really down. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. no, it's a great, it's a yeah. great question. I'm like, I'm like, you know, to parallel your question, is this person blank enough? Well, am I qualified enough to answer that question? Uh, Andy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to popcorn to you. It's a great. Oh, Lord. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know quite how to answer this question personally, right? I mean, it's like when, when it comes to casting, you do kind of take it project by project, right? Um, 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 there are times when it's like uh, I will bring people in against type or against what the director has requested just because I see opportunities in, alternate, in an alternate route. And, um, you know, that that has come to great fruition. We actually had a project a while back that was written around a, uh, a mixed race, Asian, mixed Asian, uh, Asian American character. And um, in the process of auditioning all of these mixed race, a a Asian American actors for uh, this one role, um, it started to become a question of what if all of the characters in this play are of various mixed race identities. And uh, it was lucky enough that it was a new work and uh, we had a mixed race playwright who uh, was interested in ex exploring this and the director and the, the playwright worked together to basically alter the original intention of the play uh, and, and build it around this idea of, you know, how, how uh, various people of various mixed race backgrounds kind of find solidarity or, 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 you know, do not relate because the, 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 the experiences are so diverse. Right. Um, uh, but that is like one, <laughs> one, uh, one in a million project where like you have the opportunity to adapt the, 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 the project to who we ultimately ended up casting or who came into the room. Um, um, you know, I, I do think that there is, there's a lot of interesting dialogue, right now at this moment around um the the new disney plus series uh that's the the adap adaptation of um um doogie hauser which is starring uh an asian american mixed race asian white female lead character who is playing someone of mixed race with indigenous hawaiian background and of course it is it is great to have the representation. However, 
there is a problematic aspect of this when it is put in the context of the underrepresentation of indigenous Hawaiians or uh, of, 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 of native Hawaiians. Um, um, and it's something I don't know how to, you know, I, I am not even qualified to, to speak to that. I think everyone is trying to find ways to, to, to navigate it, uh, uh, you know, um, both uh, in terms of, you know, access, both access for the talent and the artists, as well as access to the talent and the artists, right? Um, how specific can you get? Uh, or how do you find the parallel of for like white actors who are not questioned when they done an Irish, a Scottish, or a, a British accent, right? Or, or um, African American actors who are cast as uh, African peoples from Nigeria or South Africa or Ethiopian, etc. Right, those actors who are not necessarily questioned in the same way, but there is still at the heart of this an issue of representation. And the difficult thing in terms of the API identity, which is Asian Pacific Islander, and we forget sometimes that Pacific Islander is a separate identity. Like you know, I mean, I remember having a very interesting conversation with a colleague of mine in New Zealand where Pacific Islander is its own thing. And it was a bit of a culture shock for her to come to the, the States and go, oh, why, why are the Maori people, like, you know, aligned with the Asian American, the East Asian community? Because it's a completely different cultural thing. And then I had to explain to her, like, because Asian American or Asian Pacific Islander American is really more of a political designation than it is really a culture, right? Like if I were to say, what is my cultural identity? I'd say I'm a Star Trek American, right? Um, um, or I'm a you know, comic book American, right? But you know, this is a political identity to go, okay, I have to react to how the majority of you know, America as a result of years of white supremacy treats me and treats me in similar ways as it treats you, right? So it's coalition building. Um, and uh, I don't know. I'm starting to, to wander. <laughs> <laughs> Dancing no. around the topic. No, yeah. but but part, but part of the reason why I wanted to bring that up is because um, I find it more and more common for um, speaking as a mixed individual of Asian descent. I, my last name already gives that away. So I don't feel as if I have to promote myself as being part of that community. But there are some mixed individuals that I know who don't have that same last name privilege. And so how they present themselves or promote themselves, they really, some of them really push. And so it brings up the conversation of like, what do you feel like you have to disclose to find work and still fight for this is me, I can do that, but I'm not exactly that. So it's a, it's a fine, it's a fine line. But I, I just wanted to bring that up because I thought it was very interesting of the, the topic of what do you disclose, and how do you really I'll, represent uh, yourself? I'll, I'll jump in. I have a very specific story right on those lines. Um, my wife and I, uh, both art and feminists, uh, we both in abstract think the idea of a woman changing her name for the last name of the man is kind of weird, like, you know, but her name was Crystal Smith and she's half Chinese. And she was like, I want that Murakami last name. <laughs> she wants, she wanted to like, you know, and, and as an artist, I'm like, okay, aesthetically, I get it. Yeah. That's a great idea. You should do that. You know, like artistically Crystal Murakami way better. So, um, so yeah, I totally hear that. And I like my name, I love my name, David Murakami, Japanese Jew. Perfect. It's all, it's all advertised right there. Um, but to, to get to your, your point, I, I can give you a couple examples from like, I have been really fortunate to be able to work on how to have, uh, had the chance to work on productions that do challenge my own identity, engage my own, own identity, did a production with Luis Valdez on Japanese internment, um, called Valley of the Heart, which was really a great opportunity to dive into my past there where, you know, as a Japanese American, my own grandmother never talked about her history because, you know, you don't mendokusai, you don't, you don't complain. Um, 
And I had the chance to do an opera about uh, the Holocaust, the Jews uh, concentration camps um, at Auschwitz. And in both cases, you know, I, I, I have the feeling, I mean, it wasn't so explicit that I was called upon to design those shows because of my ethnicity. So that was a, a reason that, that they felt that I would be some sort of expert. I'm not. I feel like I have some sort of some sort of history and personal identity that connected me with the project, but does that make me an authority? Does that make me some kind of like, and the answer in, in my own head is no, I'm, I'm no, not the authority on those things. You know, in many ways, the inter interment of my ancestors is as foreign to me as it would be to anybody, but it's all about approaching it with respect and patience. And if you're able to do that, I, I, I feel like the question of, where on the spectrum from blackface, we all know that's bad, to, you know, switching people's eye color with contact lenses, obviously that's fine. But along that spectrum, where do we draw the line? And it's a sincere question that does not have a particularly easy answer. But I think the place where you start is, are you going to be respectful? Are you going to be interested? Are you going to take the time to learn um, what you don't know? whether you are of the culture that's relevant or not. Um, and that's the starting place. Yeah, and I was just curious, uh, like uh, Jonathan, as uh, from a stage manager's point of view, have you experienced um, any specific hiring where they were specifically seeking out somebody like you? Or did they make it specific where you're like, I want to do that because I know I would fit in there? or anything along those lines? That's a good question. Um, I feel like, yeah, I mean, yes, yes. Of course, I've gotten emails that they're like, we're seeking an Asian American stage manager for such and such. Um, or it's a little more generalized, I think, for stage managers at times, where it's like, we just need a BIPOC stage manager to do this because it's a play about not white people. Um, and in a lot of ways, like a lot, if you look at my body of work, like a lot of it is Asian American, a lot of it is um, black plays with black artists, or um, it's actually kind of, I think just those two. And then a few sprinkled in with white, white only plays. Um, but I feel like in, going into like disclosure, like I think part of me is like, if there's like a play that I want to do, I just, I'll reach out to them and tell them I would like to do it. I think my name is like extremely vague, like Castanian is actually from my dad's side and it's German, but it doesn't sound German. Um, I don't have anything in my name to give the impression that I'm Asian. Um, but if you look me up, like my digital footprint, you can tell from what I speak up about, what I do, the organizations I'm involved with, that I'm part of this community. So like there is a level of disclosure and I think there is a there is there has been a level of like me trying to express that without having to be like, hi, I'm a mixed Vietnamese person like every time I meet someone. Um, and part of the reason I disclose in the way that I do and is partly because also more specifically Vietnamese people are extremely underrepresented in this field. There's not a lot of us. And there's not a lot of stage managers who are Vietnamese. There's, I've met like three or four other ones so far. Um, so um, in a lot of ways, yes. So there's been, yes, there's been times where I've been sought out for that reason, but um, I think you have to kind of feel it out of like, is there a genuineness to what they're seeking or are they just trying to do a, like a checkbox? And like, am I actually prepared to to serve the show in the ways that it needs to and for the people in the room. Like I am, just because I am of color, I'm a person of color, it doesn't mean that I'm the right fit for a play that's about um, the black experience or black folks and black bodies. Like I can relate to a degree, but I, I don't know all the intricacies of it. And I don't know the dynamics of the room. I don't know, um, I don't always know all the culture. So like, Am I a right fit for it? It's questionable. Yeah, and it's it it does go down this fine line of this is me, here's my art. 
and then also them seeking out of we want this specific look or the specific feel and we think you can add to it i'm curious randy does as a scenic designer does that get brought into your world often where they seek out designers from a specific background or a culture where they're like we need all authenticity we're gonna go find that specific individual to bring that well there's a lot of things that have been said over all of this and i think um a lot of it that i agree with uh, to speak i guess first to back question of like casting and being enough if like there's an asian character and like we cast a mixed actor and like are they asian enough to play this role um a counter thought i have around like being enough of anything is that um being mixed is also enough um and i think our narrative around or things are not now more diverse there's like white stories or like bipoc stories or there's white people white characters and bipoc characters and not many mixed characters um especially in my own experience when i hear all of these conversations where that's so polarizing as someone who is chinese and white i inherently carry you know the oppressor and the oppressed within my own body and like that's the narrative that i exist with day to day and um and then as far as my own last name it gives it away that, that i mix my whole life it's been the two of those there my mom and my dad um and actually the as far as my name thing like yeah my last name's a giveaway but i've also been more concerned with my gender and my name and brandy is intentionally a gender neutral name so um that leaves that one up in the air and and as a question um but being mixed race like uh, and in, even in the san francisco bay area i have not let me think there's one project that I was brought on to because I was Asian, at least one. And it was um, Ferocious Lotus, which is an Asian American uh, theater company in the Bay Area, uh, run at the time by, oh my God, she's head of, um, she's in Minneapolis right now. I'm just blanking on all of, all of, um, Lily, Lily Tonka Lily, Lily. Um, uh Her production of Two Mile Hollow, and that was, Asians everywhere um, because it, it needed to be. Um, and of course, that's written by Leah and Nako Winkler, um, also uh, a mixed Asian uh, player who I know who's been part of this festival. Um, I think that's the only one that's coming to mind where I was specifically hired because of that <laughs> reason. Um, but otherwise, I didn't like grow up going to school having the weird lunches that kids made fun of. I didn't have language i didn't have i didn't go to chinese school like things that would maybe be a hallmark of like a chinese american experience i don't have um but that still makes my experience chinese american um and that's something that uh is always going to be true even if it doesn't have these certain hallmarks doesn't fall into these certain stereotypes um and I'm remembering, actually, it was, I think, Jessica Wong's Purple Cloud at Kata a few years ago it was the first time that I saw, like, at the time, like, a Kappa mixed Asian character. I had seen, of course, mixed Asian actors, I'm sure, on Disney Channel and, and in the media that I consumed. But that was the first mixed Asian character that I'd ever saw uh, in my life at 22 or something like that. And so that feeling of recognizing that oh you exist and i exist were real um that sort of feeling is is life-changing and so um seeing yourself for the first time i feel like it's my job as a world builder as a scenic designer finally coming back to your question um and also speaking to i think what david was saying is i may not be able to design a, this show that's in Chinatown. I may not be able to design, um, you know, even the living room of a um, immigrant family, um, but I think I have the ability to be respectful and um, do my due diligence to be in service of the story, even if I don't share in that experience. Um, service is really the word that um, I've fallen into most recently. 
um, as far as my process and listening to the other people in the room who may be better stewards of the culture or of the experience or of the dynamic. Um, and also recognizing when it's not the right room for me to be in and, and, and respectfully decline. Um, I, that's my own sense of feeling like um, I have the wherewithal um, to dive into a certain story or history. Um, but I know for myself, just in the grad school experience I'm about to go into, like I am interested in, in diving into stories that I may connect to more personally and going on that creative process because I haven't had that quite yet. It's been, it's mostly connected to my queer experience that I've found affirming stories and projects to work on, but um, less so of my mixed Asian experience. Yeah, Andy? You yeah, uh, you know, one other thing I just want to add to, right? It's like, I mean, and of course, th there's no easy answer to any of this, right? Uh, because there's two, there's two things. There's how do I, as an artist, do things authentically to the best of my ability? Every artist tries to do the research before they go into a project. Uh, that's how you do, do good art. Um, and, you know, and we will all have advantages based on how much code switching we do in our regular life and how that applies to our research versus how little uh, code switching another artist who has a less diverse background uh, and therefore isn't used to or does can't recognize the, the code switching that some people uh, in, or, or some communities uh, deal with. Um, you know, the other thing too, like, I mean, you know, we're here in a panel. I am, I am a, a non-mixed race, uh, you know, Chinese American amongst the panel of mixed race Asian Americans. Uh, but even still here, you know, it's like there is still, uh, I, I always kind of comment on how little representation in mixed race circles I see of mixed race Asian Americans who are also African American or Latinx right or of other other uh, or south asian or right and 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 that's something that i i always like how do i how can i in my position here at esos players and you know we have done various initiatives to support mixed race uh, uh, narratives and performers uh, as you know as much as we can in a four show season but but you know to find out that we have you know there are a number of african american Asian American mixed race people, but do not claim their Asian Americanness or their Asian American identity because that is not how casting or the majority of the industry will ever treat them, right? That is heartbreaking to me, right? And that's and that's the, the thing where I could go, God, please put, you know, Wong in your middle name or or something so I I, I know how to find you, and 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 I you know I can start developing programs around nurturing this, right? Um 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 you know. How, that that's the hard thing because we don't want to get judged, we don't want to get pinch and hold, we don't want to be interrogated for our race or identity or experience. But also, um, how can we support people to support us? Um, is is a broader question, right? Yeah, and thank you for bringing up support because I feel like that was part of the reason why Manfest was created was to support cultivating culture and the mixed Asian and. Um, it's Asian and Pacific Islander community. And so um, before we run out of time, I do want to highlight more of you all individually. So can we just go around? Um, we'll go David, Andy, Randy, Jonathan. Um, is there any last words that you would like to share with us? Um, specifically, if you're working on a project that you, that you can share, that would be great and fun. Or if you're a part of a screening or a project within Manifest that we can check out. That would be awesome. Very briefly, uh, I know we're low on time. I am working on a project in Saudi Arabia and Cairo right now, which is very exciting. Um, dealing with uh, Ab Abdel Halim Hafez, which was basically like the Ar Arabic Elvis, where I am having to, yes, insert myself in a culture that I know absolutely nothing about. I do know now, I've done a lot of research. Um, the biggest challenge with that is in Arabic culture, I know like, Western people, you know, Western, it's so misunderstood in Western society, but you know, there's the thing about can't show the prophet Muhammad, you can't enact, you can't paint. Well, that's actually something that's endemic to all of Arabic culture is that you don't enact, you don't impersonate. That's just a cultural like, like temple. How do you do a biography on stage and honor that, 
but also, and so it's, it's again, it's all about, I, and this is what I love doing most in my life is just finding ways to tell stories that uh, touch on sensitivities that embrace people's cultures that I find fascinating that I didn't know about myself uh, and honor it and bring uh, people together. So I'm really excited for that. And yeah, that's uh, going up in Cairo and Saudi Arabia. Um, very good. Thank you. Um, okay, so I can say, of course, East West Players has continued to do all of our programs, which include uh, our our main, or for now, our digital main stage productions. We have a production of uh, a play called The Sitiana, which is coming up very soon. Uh, so do look for that uh, and look for all of the other classes. So we have a lot of digital classes online. So if you're not in LA, there's still resources available to you. And um, yeah, for people who are submitting to us, um, you know, if you don't want to necessarily name things about yourself, uh, a, a good trick is you can also just list it, your, list it in your special skills, right? Because these are our special skills, whether it's what languages do I have? You know, I mean, I can't speak Cantonese, but I, you know, I can understand and it's something I can know how to navigate um, um, uh, uh, or I have a brief understanding uh, of Cantonese. Um, you know, three-year-old Cantonese, basically. <laughs> uh, if that's a way to identify and give clues, you know, or or even, you know, as a designer, um, you know, just, you know, what art styles do you have a background in um, that kind of define your aesthetic? It might, it might include um, um, some traditional styles or, or experiences that you have had. And you know, that's not something I always see, like, uh, with designer resumes. It's always what shows have you done, but what are your skills, right? Um, have you been, uh, you know, a programmer? Have you been a drafts person? Have you, uh, are you also a watercolor paintist? Are you, you know, you know, th those are things that will help inform um, people as they hire you or try and figure out what is your aesthetic and how do you jive with me? Um, and they can also be tools to, uh, oh gosh, there's only a couple minutes. Someone else talk. <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, uh, Randy, we're going to hit Jonathan first because I do know you have a hard out soon. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, right now, I am the production stage manager on an off Broadway show at the Atlantic Theater Company called The Last of the Love Letters. It's one of the first shows back um, in person off Broadway. It is designed by a team, designed and led by a full team of women and gender non-conforming people um, and designers. And the team is, I think we're actually, we're all um, BIPOC um, and uh, of the global majority. So um, you should come see that. It runs until September 26. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't have any other words. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I don't have much going on aside from school, uh, <laughs> just starting up next week. Um, but I am hoping to start um, a professional Instagram um, um, that will kind of recap my that last few years in the Bay, just as a reflective for me, but also kind of keeping folks updated with how school's going and and, and what I'm up to and, and all the new fun skills I'll be learning. And so that's at R Wong Westbrook Design my Instagram handle. That's one place to follow me. Awesome. Well, I would like to thank Andy, David, Jonathan, and Randy for sharing your experiences and knowledges with us this afternoon. To learn more about them or to get in contact, please visit MAMFEST's uh, the speaker profile page for each of them. Um, there you can find links to their social media and websites. So thank you all for sharing this afternoon with us. Happy Friday, and I hope you enjoy the rest of MAMFEST. Thank you very much.